Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, Libya and the winds of change. Libya! 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 Jammed signals, internet shutdowns, and still, the story gets out. The sharpest pen in South Africa. A cartoonist tests the limits of political satire. The award-winning journalist and the award he won for taking down a U.S. military commander. And there's big money in aggregation. Our web video of the week. Why pay for journalists to work when the work of journalists can pay you? For more than two months now, the Arab world's season of revolution has kept news organizations busy and audiences riveted to their television and computer screens. It is difficult to overstate the role that media have played in these historic stories. The citizens of Tunisia, Egypt and Libya, among others, have seen a combination of online social media and aggressive coverage by satellite news channels drive stories and bring once omnipotent dictators to their knees. And it's happened despite the authorities and Libya's just the latest example, locking out reporters, jamming television transmissions and shutting down the internet and phone networks. Our starting points this week are Tripoli and Benghazi, the cities at the heart of the Libyan uprising, a story that in the absence of professional journalists on the ground has been uploaded by ordinary citizens for the world to see. In 1988, a well-known Arab figure and part-time author wrote, when the instrument of government is a dictatorship, a society has no means to express its position and rectify the situation other than through violence. It has no other option but to rise in revolt. <laughs> Muammar Gaddafi seemed to take issue with that statement in his speech last week, which is odd because he wrote it. The Gaddafi speech was delivered on Libyan state-run TV, where his son Saif appeared before him. The channel Al Jamahuria has been unusually entertaining recently, if not well received. One of the strangest things about dictatorships in the Arab world is that they never sort of progressed in any scientific or even psychological way. <laughs> to put Saif al-Islam's picture up on a big screen was asking for trouble. Of course they threw their, their shoes. And I thought to myself, well, what an epitaph. 42 years of Gaddafi and his son is threatening civil war against his own people. <laughs> and then to see Gaddafi under his umbrella later on, I mean, you know, there is truly an element of sort of Hitlerian dominance mixed with Walt Disney and, you know, Mickey Mouse in all this. However, state-run TV is just a sideshow. Like Egypt and Tunisia, the Libyan story has been propelled by web video. What distinguishes Libya from the revolutions that preceded it, at least in its initial stages, has been the almost complete reliance on citizen journalism. Gaddafi learnt from the mistakes in Egypt and Tunisia and he very early on decided he was going to shut down the news environment. He kicked out Al Jazeera, he kicked out all foreign correspondents. Images circulating on the internet, bypassing the government's media clampdown. But the problem is, of course, that this is amateur footage, we can't substantiate it, and so it's given us this very uh, blurry, uh, chaotic understanding of what's actually been going on. And of course it has a certain kind of quality to it, you know, it's very raw and it's also not comprehensive. But at the same time it's incredibly authentic. And I know lots of Libyans, including myself abroad, have been acting as sort of ad hoc news room, you know, managers, getting accounts and compiling them and trying to make something coherent and true of them. But uh, I think also Libyans inside clocked onto this. This is extraordinary because remember, Libya does not have the internet activism culture that exists in Tunisia or in Egypt, for instance, or even in Bahrain. <laughs> so what we're seeing is that the people on the ground understood what happened in Tunisia and, and Egypt and Bahrain and knew that the internet is, is their ally. <laughs> From Tunis to Cairo and now Tripoli, the story arcs have been remarkably similar. Protests initially documented and uploaded by activists. Promises of reforms that protesters reject 
and declarations of war by embattled leaders against what they see as a common enemy. All the Arab dictators, one after the other, have all blamed uh, the media for, for their situation. Uh, in particular, they've singled out Al Jazeera. So the fact that Gaddafi uh, blamed the Arab media really is desperate. I don't think that Libyans would uh, believe him for one minute. The fact is Libyans know what kind of man he is better than anybody else and uh, they have, uh, through the internet, an, uh, an understanding of, of what's really happening. I called Benghazi just before coming here. People are chanting in the square, uh, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, هذه الحلقة الأخيرة. Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, this is the final episode. So they're calling out to Al Jazeera as a kind of supporter. Not because there's an international conspiracy, as the Qaddafis claim. It's a supporter because they are after uh, freedom and they're after things to be reported accurately and for their for their plight to be known by the world. Not that Al Jazeera is universally popular with protesters seeking political change. The network's wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Egypt and Libya did not go down well with many Bahrainis. They were objecting to Al Jazeera, particularly to Al Jazeera, on the grounds in Bahrain that they thought that the uh, king or the crown prince had somehow bought off the satellite channel um, and thus they were getting less coverage than they, for example, Libya got or Egypt got. I actually explained that, you know, Egypt was a much bigger and more important country and Libya was turning into a civil war. It didn't, in terms of news value, match what was comparatively little violence, comparatively only, in Bahrain. The power struggles across North Africa pit popular protest movements against long-time undemocratic leaders, all of whom have used the media means at their disposal, state-run TV, to try to talk, lecture, and sometimes shout their way out of political trouble. These leaders in the Arab world, remember, this ties back to the theory of the za'im. The za'im is the leader. And when a leader goes on TV, part of what he's trying to achieve is that to use media to drive his points as the larger-than-life figure. And the one who set up the standards for this is none other than Jamal Abdel Nasser, who through his speeches in the 50s and the 60s was able to galvanize millions across the Arab world. The problem is that at the time, Jamal Abdel Nasser uh, still had credibility to back up his speeches. And, and the real disconnect here in reality is that uh, Barak, uh, Ben Ali before him, and now Qaddafi do not understand the disconnect. That's how disconnected these people are from their people. Because the medium is not the message, not anymore, especially when it's state control. The media are the message, and the messengers are everywhere. Our Global Village Voice is now on Libya and the role media, old and new, play in that developing story. Widespread images of the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt have inspired people throughout the Arab world to rise up for the same thing. But that doesn't detract from the core roots of these revolutions, and that is people are simply fed up with their autocratic rulers, the lack of freedoms and lack of economic opportunities. Mass media is simply conveying those sentiments and can't be held responsible for the incompetence corruption and autocracy of the Arab regimes. Libya has been tough to follow because of the lack of international media, but I think it's also helped show the value of all the different kinds of media that we have. From the first person YouTube and Twitter accounts of Libyans to the Twitter accounts of big media companies, and then you still have the traditional news story which isn't as precise as it normally is because of that lack of access, but it still gives a lot of details you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. I think that the recent events in Libya has demonstrated once more that state media in this part of the world are as out of touch and resistant to adapt to reality as the regimes they said. Because Gaddafi has an iron grip on the state media, he and his son viewed the coverage of the uprising by foreign media channels as a, an act of hostility from those foreign states. If you've got a beef with the global news media and you'd like your opinion heard as one of our Global Village Voices, we suggest you join the thousands of our viewers who already follow us on Facebook and Twitter. They go to those sites to find out what stories we're working on so they can weigh in. Or you can just get in touch with us via email. We're at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Turning now to Listening Post News Bites, Hungary has promised to water down its contentious new media law, and while the amendments 
are popular with the European Commission, there are more changes being demanded in Hungary itself. The law went into effect January 1st and drew thousands of protesters onto the streets of Budapest. They said the new media watchdog body had far too much power. The fines that media companies were subject to, as high as a million euros, were disproportionate. And it all felt a bit like a throwback to Hungary's communist past. Coincidentally, Hungary took over the rotating EU presidency the day the law took effect, which caused some degree of embarrassment in Brussels. The amendments to the law reportedly address, amongst other things, the question of disproportionate fines, which the EU is saying helps make the law compatible with EU laws and standards. Critics in Hungary, though, say they're still concerned about the newly created media watchdog body. They say it remains dominated by supporters of the government. A prominent online activist from Bahrain has been released from jail. Ali Abdul Imam founded an online discussion forum called Bahrain Online back in 1999. Abdul Imam quickly rose to become one of Bahrain's top bloggers recognized as a voice who used the internet to push for political reforms. But the content did not go down well with the Bahraini authorities. They blocked the site in that country. Abdul Imam was arrested back in September, long before the protests started there, and accused of publishing what the regime said was false news on his site. His trial sparked criticism around the world with support from groups like Human Rights Watch, and it prompted an internet campaign to free him. You may remember a piece that we did last June on Michael Hastings. He's the reporter whose magazine profile of General Stanley McChrystal ended up costing the commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan his job. The reporter had up close and personal access to McChrystal and published the general's scornful comments about the Obama administration's approach to the Afghan war. Today I accepted General Stanley McChrystal's resignation. Obama ended up demanding McChrystal's resignation for undermining civilian control of the U.S. military. You think you know America. Another story that we looked at last year that ended up winning a Polk Award, the Washington Post series, Top Secret America. The series was two years in the making and revealed the scope of the expanding security and intelligence apparatus in the U.S. in the post-9-11 era. When Rupert Murdoch erected a paywall around his Times of London newspaper's website, he hoped that other newspapers would follow suit. Well, he'll be happy with this development. The Telegraph Media Group, which publishes the UK's Daily Telegraph, is reportedly preparing to announce that starting in September, it will begin charging for some of its digital content. Word is the Telegraph is not looking at a full paywall like the Times is. Its approach will resemble that of the New York Times, which allows free access to a certain number of stories before asking readers to start paying. Murdoch, the world's biggest media tycoon, has long maintained that newspapers can no longer afford to allow free access to their sites. But figures released in November suggest that since going behind its paywall, the Times' website is down 4 million viewers a month. That's a drop of about 62 percent. We recently reported on how money problems had caused the closure of the Irrawaddy magazine, a publication that offered critical reporting on Myanmar from its base in Thailand. Now, another exiled news outlet, an independent TV and radio station, is in similar trouble. The Democratic Voice of Burma, better known as DVB, broadcasts via satellite into Myanmar from Oslo, Norway. It's run by a network of Burmese expatriates and offers the kind of uncensored reporting that's banned by the military regime on its domestic news channels. But according to DVB's deputy manager, that could be about to change. Kin Mong Win has revealed that the organization has seen a drop of about a million dollars in funding since Myanmar's elections last year. And as a result, the group has been forced to slash some of its programming and some of its staff look set to lose their jobs. Jacob Zuma is a satirist's delight, a cartoonist's dream. The South African president provides plenty of fodder and keeps Jonathan Shapiro on his toes. Shapiro, or Zapiro, as he's known professionally, is the country's most provocative political cartoonist. He has been since the days of apartheid. Recently, Zapiro has taken his satirical wit from print to video, or at least he's tried, but he can't find a television channel to air his show. The content's been deemed a bit too edgy by broadcasters in South Africa's relatively young democracy. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead caught up with Zapiro recently in Cape Town to talk to him about his cartoons, his new show, and Zapiro's looming legal showdown with the country's president. Jonathan Shapiro didn't start out as an editorial cartoonist. It was South Africa's infamous past that led him there. The 
uh, apartheid regime was so oppressive uh, that I had to do something about it. I became an activist in 1983 and uh, gradually my activism and my cartooning kind of fused into one thing. Something the country needed, a white voice in the media, unafraid of the authorities. But even in the new South Africa, Zapira is still a thorn in the government's side. Things have changed enormously since the old days. We knew our enemy then. It was easy to be concerted in your fight against an, an, an oppressive and evil regime. The difficulties uh, in, the, in the democratic era are that things are a lot less uh, easy to pin down. It's also been hard for me to criticize people who I, I know, who um, I've been on the same side as for, for a long time. But I think I, I managed to, you know, as I often say, beat the politically correct stuffing out of myself. He did that and more with this cartoon. It showed incumbent president Jacob Zuma preparing to rape Lady Justice. Zapira called it a metaphor for the abuse of justice that allowed Mr. Zuma to take office. But there was a little bit more to it than that. Our sitting president was acquitted of rape charges under very controversial circumstances. A lot of people, myself included, were not very impressed with that verdict. People within the ANC, including Zuma himself and a number of others who, who were saying that I was unfair to portray him as a rapist after he'd been acquitted. I am saying it is clearly metaphorical because the figure of Lady Justice is a metaphor. But be that as it may, it is sailing very close to the wind for that very reason. Mr. Zuma then sued Zapira, which led to this on-air skirmish. I am doing exactly what journalists and what cartoonists and what satirists do in democratic societies. And I thought, well, I'll ambush him a little bit because, you know, he is suing me. And unfortunately, I got cut off when he made a statement which I thought was just grandstanding. You are invading my own dignity. But at least I got, I got my say in and a lot of people heard. Now, more than two years later, Zapira has finally been issued with a court summons for the Lady Justice cartoon. I hope it goes to court in 2011 because I can't wait to see the president of the country having to explain how the cartoon that Jonathan did was irrelevant to what he had done um, before he became president of the country. This whole case against San Shapiro would set a very unfortunate precedent. You know, it will be satirists now. Tomorrow will be journalists, the next day will be particular analysts, on and on and on. We're coming from this country where in the 80s people used to get the newspapers with big holes in them from what they, because the state felt that it was not in the public interest. We don't want to go back there. Here's another technique Mr. Zuma doesn't like. Zapira attaches a shower head to the president's head. It dates back to his rape trial when he admitted to having unprotected sex with an HIV-positive woman. To reduce the risk of infection, Zuma said he just took a shower. This is a very strange statement from someone who had been the head of the AIDS, the National AIDS Council in South Africa. So I, I did a cartoon where the shower appeared on his head, and it actually said AIDS prevention. For the next three years, every cartoon that featured Zuma featured the shower head. That changed in mid-2009, but only temporarily. When he became president, I thought, well, let me, let me give him a chance. And I did a cartoon where the, his critics are giving him a break and the shower is now suspended. So the shower just sort of lifted up and hovered in the air when it was found that he had even more babies out of wedlock. Uh, he's, got, he's married to three women, but uh, these were even outside of those marriages. So, of course, the shower had to come back. This time, it was bigger than ever. Throughout this period, Zapiro was planning a satirical venture, not for print, for broadcast. As my old friend Frankie used to say, start spreading the news. He created a political puppet show called The News. Zapiro teamed up with a French producer, Thierry Cossuto, who moved to South Africa in 1998, four years into majority rule, and saw a satirical opportunity staring back at him. I looked at the political field, um, the landscape, and I thought, wow, this, this is like a chessboard with so many different, um, very colorful characters. Having a quasi-saint like Nelson Mandela on the one hand, on the other hand, having a quasi-neo-Nazi like Eugene Terblanche, and everything else in the middle. 
The news was commissioned by the SABC, the country's state broadcaster. But when the SABC demanded editorial control, the deal fell apart. There are certain tests that are best done behind closed doors. Every broadcaster has got editorial uh, policies that they have got to adhere to. You have got to make sure that whatever product you put on air adheres to your uh, editorial policies. That is the editorial control we wanted. The producers wanted to project it as a political issue. Government is influencing it. But if that was the case, the other broadcasters in the country, they also rejected it. Therefore, what does that say? None of the mainstream broadcasters um, um, were ready for our show. I, don't th I think the people of South Africa are ready for Zan News, but the broadcasters were, were not ready. Our YouTube channel is the number one YouTube channel in, in the country. Our fan page on Facebook is one of the biggest in the country as well. 17 years after the end of apartheid, race remains the defining social issue in South Africa, and that is reflected in the country's media, especially when two white men lampoon politicians who are predominantly black. A lot of people have strong opinions about white people being the purveyors of news, the creators of information, the creators of stories about African people, and um, I think a lot of us have had enough of that. Whether or not the composition of the team that produces the news has influenced whether, you know, the, the, the fact that we, we're not on TV is, is, is not certain because in fact it's a very mixed group producing this, this show. I think it's more about the strength of our criticism and the fact that we don't want to be editorially controlled. Jonathan Shapiro doesn't want to be anybody's puppet, which is why for now his colorful cast of political caricatures is spreading the news online. More Global Village Voice is now on satire and how it plays in South African media. I think satire is hugely important in South African media. We're a country that jokes a lot, we laugh a lot, we like drama. It's one of the ways that we communicate. If the media is going to be relevant, I think satire is massively important. South Africans understand it, South Africans get it. Uh, we understand complex humour and we make use of it all the time. Satire doesn't play as much of an important role as we'd like to think it does. It certainly doesn't play the same role in function as it did in the late 1980s, for example, during the dying days of apartheid. It doesn't have that intensity and focus. I think the period is great. My only concern is that there's only the period at the moment. There isn't that broad range of cartoonists and caricatures that we'd like to actually see, and that, that is a concern going into the future. Finally, a couple of weeks back, we reported on the $315 million sale of Ariana Huffington's news website, the Huffington Post, to AOL. That's a lot of money, especially considering that the bulk of the Huffington Post's traffic goes there for aggregated material. That's content from other news websites that the Huffington Post simply directs its readers to. Judging from our web video of the week, the online political cartoonist Mark Fiore thinks Ms. Huffington's financial windfall is a pretty good return for a mere aggregator. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. Multi-millionaire media maven Ariana's Huffington Post is now a cool $315 million richer. A fabulous, darling. This journalista's jackpot is all thanks to the advent of aggregation or look here's some stuff I found on the web why pay for journalists to work when the work of journalists can pay you if only they would have thought of this sooner Ernie Pyle here reporting from my study where I just discovered some neat links on the war and did a bang-up job of search engine optimization extra extra give us your work for free and we'll make millions blog all about it Agricopolis was a success, as aggregation was the new key to big bucks. Merger upon merger and links upon links until new aggregators began to aggregate aggregators. Website A used content from site B in exchange for B getting eyeballs from A. Soon B realized it could do the same thing and gathered from site C. But C was no dummy, and soon A through Z all did the same thing. Until one day, little Tommy was at school researching a report on journalism and democracy. Tommy turned to the web, clicked, and found an aggregate of links linking to nothing but aggregators' links of each other's aggregated links. Good night, little Tommy, and good link.